All right, today uh, we are going to start lecturing on things related to the third chapter of the book that you've been assigned. And I have also asked you to, uh, to read a number of rather brief uh, texts dealing with cosmogony or the, uh, the, the coming into being of the cosmos. These are listed on Courseworks, I believe, for under the third session. Uh, one of the readings is from the book of Genesis, another from the uh, cosmogony or the theogony of Hesiod, who was a contemporary of Homer, another from the uh, younger Edda, which is one of the two classic works of Norse mythology, uh, one uh, from uh, the, the Rig Veda, uh, verse, you know, book 10, verse 90, the so-called Purusha Sukta, and one of them uh, is a uh, text from a Russian poem collected in the 19th century that in some ways combines both the Vedic and the uh, and the biblical uh, perspectives. Uh, I thought of going uh, farther into cosmogony in general, uh, but it, there's a question as to how important cosmogony is. Do you need to know how the universe came into being? Uh, Hesiod, for example, uh, is less interested in cosmogony, the origin of the universe, than he is in the origin of the gods. And these are two separate topics, although presumably uh, they come in some sort of succession. You know, the gods do not precede the universe in most cosmogonies, although you could argue that in the biblical cosmogony, <coughs> You know, one God does precede the universe because the universe is created by that God. Uh, other versions have some uh, concept of a void or a chaos or some sort of um, state of cosmological non-being uh, from which uh, the universe uh, emerges in, uh, and I'm not going to try and anticipate for you what's, what's in these readings because I'd like you to think about them and discuss them in discussion sections. I would point out that if you, if you try and trace this into, into China, uh, you get a, an interesting uh, figure uh, named Pan Gu. And in Chinese cosmogony, uh, there was originally a chaos, and the chaos coalesced into an egg. And when the egg hatched, out came Pan Gu. And the chaos was perfectly balanced between yin and yang. And so you get a, um, an immediate uh, conjunction of the notion of a cosmogony, but also the notion of a dualistic balance of entities. And then uh, after 18,000 years, Pangu dies, and uh, the world that we know it, uh, the, the material world that we know, is made out of taking um, uh, different parts of his body. You know, initially he is sort of like Atlas. He separates the heaven from the earth. You know, he pushes up and put, and with his arms and down with his feet, and gradually he becomes taller and taller, and the heavens and the earth become farther and farther apart. But the um, the creation of actual things uh, comes from from his body, and as you'll see in your other readings, this notion of a primal being. 
whose body uh, gives rise to different uh, material things, uh, including living beings. I believe it's, if I recall, it's the uh, the lice or the you know ticks on Pangu's body that give rise to animals, something like that. Um, low priority. Uh, if you if you look across cultures, you find that this notion of the uh, the division of this primal being is fairly widespread. But in a sense, the interesting part about the Chinese example is that it appears rather late. And various scholars have, have guessed that maybe it's simply borrowed. And then it's not really a Chinese cosmogony so much as a story that some Chinese writers got from somewhere else. And when they speculate on that, they say, well, where would this story have come from? And then, zap, they're back in the Middle East. They're back to Egypt and Mesopotamia and ancient Greece and so forth. Um, and it becomes a, uh, a scholarly uh, way of saying, well, you know, maybe really uh, the ancient Middle East is the center of everything. Now, when you go to the ancient Middle East, why does it appear, why do we get a whole chapter on it? Um, particularly, and, and the clue is that when you count the pages, count the words in the chapter, you find that the great uh, plurality of the words are those that are devoted to the story of Israel. And the, the fact of the matter is that the Bible is a huge influence on thinking about world history. <clears throat> There's a question whether one can ever escape the Bible. Not, I'm not saying you should want to escape the Bible. I'm, I'm not advoca advocating some sort of um, you know, mass rejection of uh, biblical religious tradition. I'm just saying that, that can history escape the Bible? Uh, in other words, to talk of a theme that I've mentioned before, if you were seeking to write a history of the world for all the world's peoples, uh, would you have a chapter heavily devoted to the stories contained in the Bible and to the countries that the uh, people in the Bible were either from or came into contact with? There are two ways in which history is, uh, is affected by the Bible. <coughs> uh, one of them is fairly recent. It's basic, it basically uh, becomes concretized in the 19th century, though it has roots that go back somewhat earlier. And that is to try to test whether the stories that are found in the Bible uh, can be uh, demonstrated as true through archaeology or other work that is done on the ground. <clears throat> um, this effort arose largely, as I say, in the 19th century, and it was part of a much broader movement to try to test the truth of Jewish and Christian faith uh, assumptions against um, uh, against uh, rationality. It's part of the great uh, struggle between faith and reason as it uh, played out in the 19th century during the period when, uh, when enlightenment rationality and uh, industrial revolution uh, scientism were becoming, uh, were coming together. It's of course, in many respects, Darwin's uh, notions uh, becoming the most, um, the most controversial uh, uh, test. Uh, the idea of, of 
trying to check out the reality of the biblical stories does not begin at that time, but it takes a new and more scientific turn. For example, um, the idea that uh, uh, eating of pigs is prohibited because of uh, the possibility of contracting trichinosis from parasites contained in poorly cooked pork uh, is a 19th century view, and it's part of a whole range of views trying to assert um, matters of rationality uh, into the understanding of, uh, of Jewish law. Um, this is not, well, is not new in the sense that there had always been a question as to why uh, this belief or that belief is written into law. There is one Talmudic story of, uh, you know, student going to a certain rabbi and saying, you know, do we not uh, eat this or do that because of this or because of that? Because Rabbi A says it's because of this, Rabbi B says it's because of that, and the hero of the story, Rabbi C, says, we don't do it because God tells us not to do it. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to go any further than that. It's, it's a law. Yeah, live with it. You know, man up on that. Uh, but in the 19th century, there was this, this, uh, this desire to find rationality in order to, uh, to legitimize a continuing commitment to faith among a population that was increasingly being challenged by what they saw as the progress of the modern scientific world. Uh, a lot of archaeology was done under this inspiration. Uh, the archaeology was interpreted um, uh, variously depending on who was doing it and what they found. There was an interesting book published about 20 years ago um, by a Lebanese uh, Christian author named Kamal Salibi uh, entitled The Bible Came from Arabia. It was published uh, in a variety of European languages, was quite well uh, reviewed, or at least extensively reviewed, in European press, and it never appeared in the United States. He could not find any publisher that was willing to publish this book. The thesis of the book was that prior to the time of, uh, of the Kingdom of Israel, uh, in other words, if you go back to the era of the biblical patriarchs uh, and the wandering in the desert after the exodus and so forth and so on, uh, none of the place names that are mentioned has ever been located. Uh, even though sometimes it'll give a sequence. It'll say, we went from here to here to here to here. Because nobody's ever found any of these places. He said, but if you go to a very detailed map of Arabia in the area south of Mecca, this is the province of Asir, you'll find all the place names in precisely the sequences uh, stated in the Old Testament. And the reason is, he concludes as a historian, he says, the reason this is the case is because the history of the ancient Israelites didn't take place in the Holy Land. It took place in Arabia. Hence his title, The Bible Comes from Arabia. So he says, you know, it never in the Old Testament says that the Jordan is a river. It just says it's Jordan. He says, well, there's a, there's a cliff, there's an escarpment down there in Asir province called Urdun, it's the Arabic word for Jordan. And if you look over it, you look down onto the fertile plain, which is the land of milk and honey. If you look over the Jordan, it's just as bleak on the other side of the Jordan as on the side you're looking from. Um, 
No, that isn't quite true. If you, if you go to the place where you're supposed to get a real view outside of um, Amman, uh, you know, you do see fertile fields in the distance, but, uh, but Kamal Salibi was basically writing a whole book tongue-in-cheek to say, you know, why do we follow this story which nobody can verify? Um, <coughs> The question then of archaeology uh, is one of the approaches to history that, uh, that is rooted uh, for this part of the world, the, Bibli uh, the Holy Land and its surrounding areas, in biblical stories. The other approach to history has to do with the literal story of what the Bible says taken uh, on principle. Uh, as a matter of faith, that, you know, this is what God said, um, writing in an archaic form of English, uh, under the supervision of King James the I, and, um, and therefore this is what is true. So there you get something like this. Uh, this is based on an archbishop, an Anglican archbishop named Usher, and it is his conception of how the world proceeds. So you start over here uh, with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, and you run along, uh, and the principle of this chart is to have equal space to equal, to equal time periods. So. You're moving along, here's Adam and Eve, and here's the Tower of Babel. Um, then finally you get up to King Solomon and the building of the temple. Um, and here we get Jesus on the cross. Uh, there are numbers here that tell you how many centuries have passed since the, the origin of, uh, of humankind. And so 40 centuries have passed when you get to Jesus. And then, of course, you work on past that and you get, um, uh, I'm sorry, these aren't centuries. These are um, millennia, I, I believe. Anyway, this kind of thing was taught um, as normal history through, uh, you know, through most of uh, modern European and American uh, history instruction. Uh, even though professional historians uh, had, long, uh, had long gotten rid of it, but it's, it's not so much that anybody follow, continues to follow this, uh, this succession of specific events. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, I mean you. There have been very careful, bogus calculations of exactly how old the world is, and since God created Adam and Eve uh, on the sixth day, then you know this has to be very very close to the beginning. Uh, you know there are only, there are only five days of. Of course, those five days might be billions of years because nobody knows what a day means. But, um, but that's that's where you get the the number. It's the counting backwards, adding up the ages of the patriarchs and so forth and so on. Uh, the themes that arise that one has to to see uh, showing up in history and to this day in, uh, in all sorts of history uh, are themes uh, like um, the point source of, of humans. In other words, there's a fascination with where did humans originate? Now we talk about the out of Africa uh, theory. There was a prominent um, uh, 
anthropologist named Carlton Kuhn, who back in the 1970s wrote a book hypothesizing that Homo sapiens comes into being in four different areas, and that different parts, peoples in different parts of the world are descended from four different evolutionary moments. And uh, it was massively ridiculed. Uh, you know, the, 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 the assumption that everybody has to come from one place uh, became absolutely essential because it is what underlies the notion of uh, universal human equality, which is a, you know, a marvelous and, um, uh, you know, ethically uh, uplifting notion. It's just that we have no idea whether it's really true or not. But let's assume that it is true and that it, you know, out of Africa. So you have the notion that, uh, that it, uh, that you have a point of origin. And some people say, well, you know, where did Eve live? You know, where was the primal Eve? Um, is it somewhere in Somalia? Which these days seems like an extremely poor choice. Uh, but at one time was that. Well, accompanying this, you have the notion of the Garden of Eden. And the question of, um, uh, was there a peculiarly salubrious place that gave rise to humans? Uh, probably uh, ethno-archaeologists uh, would be more inclined to think that the developments that give rise to civilization come more from the challenges of difficult environments than from the, um, you know, the lovely low-hanging fruit life of Eden. Uh, but still, the notion of where was Eden uh, remains. Uh, why, the question of, uh, that we have today uh, with us of vegetarianism, Adam and Eve are vegetarians. It's very specific in Genesis. If you are a vegan or a vegetarian, which is sort of veganism light, um, this is a very important datum because it shows that uh, eating animals is uh, abnormal and that if you go back to eating plants, it is one of the ways to go back to the ideal nature of, uh, of one's uh, humanity. I recall one person who reviewed my book on animals and said, I really learned a lot from this book. I wish, wish I'd read it years ago. But then I ran into something that proved that he doesn't know what he's talking about. And he said, because he says, as a matter of just a straightforward statement of fact, that Jesus and the 12 disciples were, veg were not vegetarians. And um, whereas it is self-evident that they were vegetarians, and therefore he doesn't know, anything, doesn't know what he's talking about. And I found myself wondering, what were they doing fishing? Were they sport, <laughs> sport fishermen? You know, let's drag a marlin out of the Sea of Galilee and throw it back in again so we can catch it again. Um, and then what about those loaves and fishes? You can say, yeah, but fish aren't red meat. Maybe that, you know, you don't have the loaves and beef steaks. Uh, but, um, but, you know, the, the, the idea that you would uh, root a contemporary ideology in a historical myth that goes back to the, to the, to the dawn times of humanity and these dawn times not, not being calculated in terms of life on the savanna or life in the forest, something like that, but rather the evidence of Adam and Eve in the garden, it, you know, it's still there. Um, when the Frankenstein monster toward the end is saying that he will go off and live uh, far from humans and not endanger anyone, and eat only plants. Um, you have this weird uh, recrudescence of the idea of uh, the vegetarian Eden. Uh, the separation of languages. Uh, 
with the uh, initially the notion of the Tower of Babel, and yet that doesn't become the primary part of the Bible that explains the division of languages because that occurs before the flood. After the flood, what you have are three sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, in the 18th century, there was a very concerted um, effort in the pioneering days of historical linguistics to identify all the world's languages as belonging to a, lang uh, to a linguistic descent line from either Shem or Ham or Japheth. Because the Bible taught that all the human's peoples are the descendants of those three. So you had the creation of that time, the 18th century, of the notion of Semitic languages. Um, languages that were spoken by people descended from Shem. And Hamitic languages spoken by people descended from Ham. But in the biblical story, because ha the descendants of Ham are uh, assigned the role of being the servants of their brothers, the Hamitic languages were assigned to people in Africa uh, because they become, by this analysis, the natural servants of, uh, of the white people who speak either Semitic or Japhetic languages. The language family that is identified as Semitic is still called that. In other words, we have today um, a clear-cut set of languages that we refer to as Semitic languages, even though I don't think anyone still believes that they are because the speakers are directly descended, descended from Shem. Uh, and, but the Semitic languages are uh, Hebrew, Arabic, uh, and the languages of Ethiopia today, but you go back historically and you get uh, Akkadian and um, Moabite and other earlier languages. And then you had a group of Hamitic languages. There is no agreement as to what those languages were but they seem to be the languages of, of Africa, but not including the Bantu group, because, I don't know, nobody seemed to think to put them in. Nowadays, what were once called the Hamitic languages have been folded into the family of the Semitic languages. And, uh, and, the, and it's been expanded, so now you have uh, a group that is more generally referred to as the Afro-Asiatic group because it's in northern parts of Africa and in, uh, in the Middle East. Um, and the word Hamitic has disappeared, but Semitic remains. Japhetic was a much bigger problem because nobody could ever, uh, people said, well, if we can identify the Semitic languages, we can identify the Hamitic languages, then the Japhetic languages are a residual category of everything else. But everything else didn't appear to have much uh, cohesion. So sometimes they get restricted to the languages of the Caucasus Mountains between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And then that gets, you know, if Japhetic languages are spoken in the Caucasus, then the people who speak those languages must be Caucasians. And so the people who are not Semites, um, you know, Arabs and Jews, and the people who are not Hamites, um, black Africans who are serving Arabs and Jews, are the rest of the people who are the white people of the world, and they must be Caucasians because that's where the Japhetic languages were spoken. And as for the Western Hemisphere or um, East Asia or Southeast Asia, who cares? Now, there's a whole series of these, uh, of these tropes, of these themes that have been clearly outgrown. Nobody, um, 
who's likely to get into Columbia is likely to believe uh, in the literal truth of these various tropes. And yet they are still very pervasive and less because of their literal meaning than because of the, of the um, sort of uh, metaphorical uses to which uh, they can be put. Um, and the story of that's in the Bible still, uh, largely because of this, uh, still gets told at a greater length than either the number of Israelites uh, or the number of words contained in the Bible uh, would indicate. In other words, if you were to collect all of the texts in cuneiform that tell you about life in Mesopotamia or in hieroglyphics that tell you about life in Egypt, during the period covered by the Bible, you would have a body of writing uh, much, much longer than the Bible. But the Bible is consolidated into a single text. It's translated into every language. And it becomes, uh, it becomes the model. Um, If you compare the way you study the, Bible, the biblical history, which in most particulars cannot be actually documented, and the way you study the history of the other uh, societies talked about in this chapter, uh, you, get, you, you get a striking difference. Uh, for the story of the Israelites, you have specific stories uh, that now we, um, we have tested against archaeological datum for the later parts, against um, uh, corroborating uh, texts that you have in other languages and so forth. But you have a, uh, a, a history and you tell that history and what is left uh, as the impression upon people are these these images or tropes like Adam and Eve, uh, the garden, uh, the fall of man, the flood, the division of the world among the sons of Noah, um, you know, so forth and, and so on, up to the, uh, you know, in the New Testament, the life of Jesus and the um, origins of the Christian uh, preaching. But if you look at the Egyptian story or the Mesopotamian story, you, we, we can extract from, from written texts a sequence of rulers, and we can say what those rulers did. And we can identify certain of them as great conquerors or as you know, total schlemiels. I mean, it's, we have a story. But the story doesn't carry an enormous amount of weight. And the story doesn't contain the overtone of, uh, of, a, of a divine uh, oversight that you have in the story of the Bible. T to some degree, that has been liberating to, to historians. Uh, one of the finest scholars uh, of the history of ancient Mesopotamia, who wrote a book called, I think, Ancient Mesopotamia, or maybe it was early uh, Mesopotamia, um, uh, A. Leo Oppenheim, uh, it's, it's about as good an introduction to Mesopotamian history as you can get. And the subtitle of it is, it's sort of ancient Mesopotamia, the portrait of a dead civilization. And in his preface, he's very specific in saying, I'm writing about this civilization as a dead civilization. 
of which nothing remains except you know, the sort of fossilized bits of lore that we can get from tablets or from you know, ruins of cities or things of that sort. So the reason is that if I thought that the story of ancient Mesopotamia made any difference to us today, uh, I would start with the question of what difference does it make to us today? But as long as I can assume that it is dead and has no lasting impact, I can describe it as it appears from the documentation. So he says, let, let, take for example the Epic of Gilgamesh. Here you have a text that goes back uh, almost certainly to the fourth millennium BC. Um, it's a story about a, uh, a king of Uruk and who has a wild and hairy friend who gets killed and he becomes morose and he goes off to the underworld looking for enlightenment on the nature of life. He says, now, there's a text that exists in a handful of cuneiform tablets, literally a handful. It wasn't a text that, for which we have hundreds of recensions of it. You know, basically, you know, just a handful of tablets, and we still have, in the existing uh, versions, we still have holes in the text where you have gaps, where there is a tablet or portion of a tablet that's broken off, and we don't know quite what happens during that. You get a jump cut from one line to another line. He says, how important was the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Mesopotamians? He says, on the one hand, we have this handful of tablets that tell us the story. On the other hand, we have thousands upon thousands of tablets that offer instruction on how to interpret uh, the patterns uh, found on the livers of slaughtered sheep. And in fact, we have a model, you know, baked clay model sheep livers that are marked in cuneiform. You know, this is the lobe that tells you that such and such, this is the lobe that tells you. These are teaching tools so that when you went to sheep liver school, uh, you could pass this around and say, now you'll notice that the anterior uh, such and such lobe uh, tells you how long the king will live. And you get used to handling it, and then of course you finally graduate, so you have a yucky, soft sheep liver that never quite matches the one you trained on, and then, you know, it's like, you do anatomy in med school, and then you have to deal with real people. Um, and Oppenheim says, clearly, divination by sheep livers meant an enormous amount in this, in this dead civilization. Um, and doesn't mean anything at all to us today. But I will give it proportional treatment. I will talk more about sheep livers than I'll talk about Gilgamesh because I'm going to follow the, the apparent importance of things as they uh, are manifested in the surviving uh, fragmentary documentation. Now, a contemporary of Oppenheim uh, was Samuel Noah Kramer, who wrote a book on the Sumerians the earliest uh, documented uh, civilization from Mesopotamia. Uh, and I, I'm absolutely certain that Oppenheim had great respect for Kramer and that Kramer had great respect for Oppenheim. Uh, and these are standard introductory works. Uh, Oppenheim for the period of, that comes after the Sumerians because his specialty was the Akkadian language which was the language of the later uh, Mesopotamian states, whereas Kramer was a specialist on Sumerian, uh, which is the language of the earliest uh, uh, 
uh, Mesopotamian state around 3000 before and after 3000 BC. You read Kramer and chapter after chapter address the question of what did the Sumerians you know, invent that affect us still today? What are the legacies of Sumer? Um, he operates on the assumption that the reason you want to know about something that happened thousands of years ago is because it still matters. It's still important to us. So uh, dividing a circle into 360 degrees, uh, you know, using a base 12, you know, these are things that Kramer will put great emphasis on, although proportionally probably had no, uh, did not have an emphasis that would, that would warrant that. Now as it turns out, since the, Gil since the Epic of Gilgamesh was originally a Sumerian myth that gets uh, translated into Akkadian, uh, both authors uh, deal with it. And for Kramer, uh, the important thing is that here is where you get what people think of as the earliest version of the story of Noah and the Flood. And since Noah and the Flood are in the Bible, and since the Bible is important to us today, therefore the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh is important to us today because of we can trace our interest in the Flood back to that point. From, a, from the point of view of historical methodology, uh, this division between Oppenheim and Kramer uh, is, is a significant one. Uh, you cannot t say everything, well, let put it differently, it is possible on certain historical topics to say everything that is knowable um, because there are so few data. Uh, but on most topics, you have to pick and choose and you have to have some principles for doing it. Um, there is a, uh, a way of looking at this that is sometimes useful. This is a graph. Uh, this axis uh, is the propensity of a historian to resort to theory. And this axis is uh, uh, the quantity of data. Um, sorry, of the wrong axis. This is theory. And this is data. And what the axis, what the graph says is that if you have almost no information, you need some sort of theoretical construct to make it hold together. Um, and at the other end, if you have vast quantities of information, you need some sort of uh, a theory to to define what is important. Now, the, the scholarly disciplines can be sorted uh, on this graph. So that something like, oh, um, let's say uh, uh, early, well, paleontology, um, history of early fossils. Uh, you'll find over here you have one bone per five million years. And so you, you say, well, let us assume this and this and the other thing. And you try and create a, uh, a chart of the evolution of organisms on the basis of extremely little data. And then here you'll have astronomy, where you have vast quantities of, of data, uh, lots of stars, and you need something to hold it all together. Now, uh, in this graph, classically, this is where history is. 
it is the, the area where you have just enough data to tell the story without using any fancy theories. Uh, historians, let's say, well into the 19th, and some of them even now in the 20th century, really swear by this. They'll, they'll say, you know, if you control your sources, and that's the idiom that was used, if you control your sources, I would say you, you have read every relevant source, um, you simply tell the story. And you don't need to know anything about economic theory or anthrop anthropological theory or political science theory or anything else. You simply tell the story and you tell it with flair and you make it interesting to read and people will, uh, will read your book and they will call you a great historian. Uh, the area where this survives most today, the part of area of history, is in biography where you can say, I have read every surviving scrap of paper dealing with the life of Henry Luce. And you can write a great book, as uh, my colleague Alan Brinkley has done. Or uh, Robert Caro's three volumes on, uh, on the career of Lyndon Johnson. Now he read everything, talked to everyone. You don't, you don't have to have any particular theory there. But what's happened, what happened in the 20th century is that gradually uh, historians started to use, started to focus on more and more meager quantities of data or more and more abundant quantities of data and they found themselves thrown into an area where they relied upon theory. So that uh, as they moved up the data scale more and more data, they started to get into uh, economic theory because the data might be things like uh, trade records that were just you know, volume after volume of um, information about, uh, about commerce. And as they went back in the other direction, uh, they would deal with, oh, the areas I know best would be technological history where you just have a few artifacts and you try and hang them together according to your theoretical construction of uh, how they were, uh, how they evolved. Um, world history uh, cannot readily be approached in, the, in this classical sense. That is to say, there is clearly too much data. Um, and clearly you need something to help you sort it out. The, uh, the theories that you may have may be borrowed from other disciplines, economics or political science or anthropology, but as in the case of Kramer and Oppenheim, they can also be intrinsically historians' concerns, such as uh, how did the past do something that affects us today, or how do we look at the past if we take as an assumption that it is totally dead and has nothing to do with who we are today. These are two different theoretical approaches. Okay, the way the Bible tends to warp this is that the Bible tells you a story. And uh, for many people, uh, that story is uh, complete and adequate, whereas the parallel narrative stories, even if they're detail that you might get for Mesopotamia or for the Phoenicians or for the Egyptians, those stories don't have the, uh, the weight of the stories out in the Bible because they haven't been you know, read in church for the last you know, several thousand years. Um, so is it justified to devote a chapter so much to the Middle East in the ancient period. Um, and is there any way of escaping it? We, I recall an author's meeting we had that was one of our more 
fractious meetings, of which there were many, and it had to do with the word tribe. The Africanist on our team said, you cannot use the word tribe for the peoples of Africa because that was a word used by colonialists and these are our nations, they're peoples. They're not, you know, they're not tribes, they're not all, not all related to each other. You can't call the Ashanti a tribe or you can't call the, um, you know, the Zulus a tribe. Uh, it simply is, uh, is imperialistic. And our American has said, you know, the same thing goes for um, pre-Columbian American uh, indigenous Americans. Uh, you know, we call them Indian tribes, but that is offensive, so we should not do that. So then we, I, I said, you know, Middle Eastern history, heck, we have tribes all over the place. We have Arab tribes, we have Turkish tribes, we have Persian tribes. Nobody's complained about it. And we said, yeah, but we're doing a world history textbook, so we have to be consistent. So after a long debate, we said, okay, we will ban the word tribe from the book. Then our ancient historian said, but the word is a Latin word, and it was used for the early divisions of the society in the city of Rome. How can we ban that? Because it is the proper word. So we said, all right, we can use tribe for the tribes of Rome, which he never did. He was just making a point. <laughs> because the more important issue was, could we talk about the 12 tribes of Israel? Because that is, is one of these things that arises from the, the weight of the Bible. Um, and we tossed around, said, can we talk about the 12 kin groups of Israel? Um, the 12 uh, descent groups? of Israel and um, we ended up not talking, I don't think he put in 12 tribes of Israel. He did? He did? Damn. I think we, to <laughs> I think we told him not to, but, um, but that, was, that was an exception because uh, the weight of biblical usage um, became more important than the, uh, than the weight of current historiographical debate. Now, there's another, there was another attack on, the, on, on tribe having to do with, uh, with anthropological theories about the origin of the state. It was particularly um, carried by a Columbia anthropologist named Morton Freed, who was a ferocious opponent of, uh, of talking about tribes in ancient China. But, uh, but our debate stuck mostly on this, um, on this issue of the offensiveness for uh, people of African or Native American uh, you know, background. Um, but anyway, it, the 12 tribes of Israel got in there and I don't think we'll ever be able to root them out. The, to my mind, there, the one thing that seems to be overarching that ties together all the stories in this chapter and even stretches more broadly is something that is, uh, is part of the Bible, um, but it also uh, is not uh, exclusively part of the Bible, and that is the idea of sacrifice. Sacrifice is perhaps the most uh, commonly encountered aspect of settled um, post-Neolithic life that you find uh, on a global basis. Everybody killed something and had a good time. Uh, today, sacrifice has um, has virtually vanished. Uh, Muslims still uh, carry out sacrifice on the Eid al-Adha uh, after the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca each year. And you'll have uh, certain other sacrificial traditions. Um, 
you'll have Chinese families who will still sacrifice on family altars, although those sacrifices tend to be of uh, foodstuffs rather than live animals. But uh, the fact that this practice has died out does not mean that it was not at one time uh, one of the few commonalities of human experience. Uh, but nobody, you know, why sacrifice occurs is a, uh, is, remains a puzzle. There is a hypothesis that has never been uh, proven that says that all sacrifice originated with sacrificing humans uh, in every part of the world and that sacrificing animals um, provided a substitution and that therefore one should presume that before the advent of civilizations you had a generality of of human sacrifice. Um, it's, you know, it's not a highly respected theory, but it, but it's a theory that has been uh, that has been tossed around, um, and it has been linked to the fact that areas that don't have suitable animals to sacrifice are often the ones that continue to sacrifice humans. That is, say, particularly in the in the New World. So the Aztecs, for example, uh, sacrifice humans, um, but they don't sacrifice domestic animals because they really didn't have much in the way of domestic animals. The Incas, on the other hand, sacrifice llamas uh, because they have llamas. And so you, you, know, you can see how the argument would be made. Um, the... Uh, the function of sacrifice uh, is another way of approaching it. Is there a common function that is achieved through sacrifice, whether it's a sacrifice of grain on an altar or the killing of an animal or the killing of a human or the pouring of uh, wine or uh, milk or uh, some other fluid on an altar or uh, the burning of, um, of ghee, you know, clarified butter or some other substance uh, on the altar. Is there some common function that you could, uh, that you could assert is proper to all human societies at a certain early stage? And if so, doesn't that make it um, plausible to give special emphasis to parts of the world where information about sacrifice is extremely abundant, uh, and that uh, and that is that would be a way of saying, well, let's look particularly at all of those sheep livers, um, or when we get to the uh, to the Carthaginians, uh, let us look at the fact that they sacrificed little children, uh, where archaeologically, um, you know, huge numbers of infant bones have been found buried uh, next to altars in Tunisia that were altars that were used by the Carthaginians uh, in that area. Uh, and doesn't it warrant, in that case, a particular emphasis upon the story of Abraham? Because isn't this the, one of these things that we have from the Bible that, that really makes sense, if, you know, to talk about why you do or do not um, mix cotton and wool or uh, linen and cotton, uh, which would be prohibited according to Orthodox Jewish law, that might not be wildly interesting. But maybe there are some things from the Bible that are uh, both biblical but also have a uh, sort of a generic um, uh, relevance. 
Uh, this is one of the issues where uh, the Bible gives us two uh, points of, of attachment. One of them is Abraham, who did not sacrifice his son Isaac. Uh, and the other is, uh, is Jesus, whose crucifixion is construed by Christians as a sacrifice. And how they construed it is a, um, you know, is, is a, it is either entirely metaphorical or it's really pretty gross. Uh, because, you know, to a Christian phrase like, you know, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Well, that can give you pause if you think of having a bucket of lamb's blood and, you know, swabbing yourself down with lamb's blood and say, okay, now I'm washed in the blood of the lamb. And, you know, this is sort of unappetizing. So people say, well, that must not be literal. But on the other hand, uh, everybody agrees that the idea of uh, purifying the altar in the temple in Jerusalem required the blood of a red heifer uh, and to wash with that blood. And we have an even more striking example that in the Roman Empire there was a very, very popular cult, particularly in the Roman army, which was the cult of Mithra. And uh, there are cult centers that have been found archaeologically in various parts of Europe that were devoted to Mithra, and such a cult center is called a Mithraeum. The, the feature of the cult center that, uh, that I want to point to is that they often had a picture or a carving showing Mithra uh, slaying an ox and they had a subterranean chamber uh, over which there was a grill and the, a genuine ox was uh, slaughtered on the grill and the blood would drip down onto the, uh, onto the uh, devotees of Mithra who were in the chamber down below. And they would literally wash in the blood of the ox, uh, not the blood of the lamb. So when that phrase, washed in the blood of the lamb, originated, it was within a late ancient uh, world in which the idea of washing in blood was, was real. Um, and then there is the question of um, eating the body and the blood of Christ. Uh, was that real uh, to, to people? I mean, it, it becomes theologically real as an official declaration later on of the Catholic Church. But how did people see it at the time? Did they see it as a symbolic commemorative event? Or did they think it was real? And of course, one of the striking things about uh, the notion of Holy Communion as the actual conception of the body and the blood of Christ is that uh, it is prohibited in Jewish law to, to eat blood. So here you are, you're consuming the blood of God coming out of a tradition of law that prohibits you eating blood of any kind. Uh, now this may seem bizarre, but um, uh, some historians of Christianity in the uh, in the 19th century, who were trying to see the rationale behind all this, uh, used the term uh, theophagy to describe Christian practices, God eating. You know, when did the Christians start eating God? Some of the uh, scholars, particularly William Robertson Smith in his book on the religion of the Semites dealing with the ancient Semitic people, said that we have texts showing that literally you would have an animal who was felt to be the, the representative of God 
you know, in your particular group. And uh, when, uh, when evening came, you would kill the animal and you would eat it uh, before sunrise. The entire animal would be consumed. Uh, now these sacrificial traditions, as like they say, we, we see them in the Bible, in the Old, the New, in the Old Testament literally, in the New Testament uh, hopefully metaphorically. Uh, but they, they have a commonality uh, across, um, across cultures because sacrifice is so, is so ubiquitous. So there is a, um, uh, the, uh, say the sacrifice of, a, of, of an ox in Eastern India. I think I've uh, given you the text about that, uh, the Mithan. Um, for a while on YouTube, they actually, you could actually see a home movie of a Bethan uh, being, being sacrificed. And, and it, you, you could compare it, say, with your uh, Sunday school picture of Abraham and Isaac, and they're in a nice altar and looking up and holding a knife, and there's a ram in the thicket, and it's all you know, very, very nice. And here is this YouTube video that shows people just ripping apart this big cow and jumping on it and killing it. And it's the most gross thing imaginable. And I think that, um, uh, you know, one of the problems of thinking about sacrifice is because we're, uh, we're we find the the, the carnal aspects of it uh, so unappealing. But if you don't get into it, then you have problems of how do you explain uh, a whole lot of phenomena that derive from ancient practices um, of sacrifice. Uh, all right, sacrifice is supposed to accomplish certain things so that uh, if you want the sun to rise in the morning, you have to perform a sacrifice. Uh, if you want to confirm uh, the succession to the kingship, uh, you have to have a sacrifice. In other words, the sacrifice itself achieves certain things. It also, for, um, for uh, animal sacrifice, provides everyone with, with meat. So that in the time of uh, say in, in the time of the New Testament, in a city in the Mediterranean basin, um, almost all of the meat that was available for people to eat was temple sacrifice. You didn't have a private meat market where you just slaughtered animals and sold, sold the meat. It's, it makes it very questionable when uh, when St. Paul talks about you're not supposed to eat meat presented at the temple, whether he's saying everybody has to be a vegetarian because there wasn't any other meat around. But uh, so you, you're supposed to accomplish something and you're supposed to uh, provide food. But divination is another aspect and this becomes uh, another theme that appears to be worldwide. Um, it isn't simply that you carry out a sacrifice in order to achieve uh, you know, something, but it's also in order to uh, divine, uh, divine the future. Uh, divining the future is one of the most constant human yems. Uh, I, I think at least you know, in the post-Neolithic times. People want to know what's going to happen, both on a personal basis and on a larger basis. And uh, nowadays we call it polling, <laughs> where we have an entire division of, the, of this 
faculty, the sociology department, dedicated to divining the future uh, through, through uh, uh, polling and through very careful statistical interpretations of polls that allow you to extrapolate. Here's where the market is going to go, or here's where the next election is going to go. I hope not. And here is this, that, and the other thing. So divining, um, uh, you know, is still with us, only it has become scientized as a product of the same uh, tendency that you had in the 19th century to scientize the Bible. You had the notion of, of scientizing divination. And as you did that, you, uh, you superseded divination based on other principles. So that um, uh, the Bible and the Quran were used for divining uh, long before uh, there was any polling. And this was done by uh, looking at the numerical value of letters because in the Greek alphabet, in the Arabic alphabet, in the Hebrew alphabet, in all of the ancient alphabets that are relevant to this chapter, uh, individual letters this isn't true of hieroglyphics or of cuneiform signs, but in alphabetic uh, traditions, from the Phoenicians onward, uh, every letter had a numerical value. And therefore, if you had a name, uh, you could calculate the numerical value of that name. And certain numbers uh, were considered to have magical properties. Uh, sometimes the number in and of itself. Uh, sometimes numbers placed in a matrix that you could add the values vertically and horizontally and diagonally and come up with the same number. That would be a magic number. Tremendous amount of, of divination by, by numerology. You still get traces of it. Uh, I discovered on the internet when I was doing trying to find out whether there was a, a sacred donkey in Buddhism. Uh, you know, there is a messiah in, in Buddhism, in the Pure Land Buddhism that becomes uh, the dominant form of Buddhism in China. And you have a messiah who's known as the Maitri of Buddha. Um, Uh, and the Maitreya Buddha uh, comes at the end of time as a messiah and then people are saved and they go to the, le to the western land which is paradise and you have very much a messianic tradition and stories of the coming of the Maitreya Buddha appear again and again in Chinese history uh, as uh, the, uh, the legends underpinning political rebellions. So the Eight Trigram Rebellion of 1813, it was organizationally built around martial arts because you had martial arts teachers who went from village to village training people and saying, if you really know the martial arts fully, you cannot be harmed. Um, this is the root of so many movies and comic books that I'm not going to go into. Read Elector Assassin, it's, it's all there. Um, uh, but the mythology behind the Eight Trigrams Rebellion of 1813, which almost killed the emperor, uh, was the coming of the Maitreya Buddha. Now, if you take these letters, M-A-I-T-R-E-Y-A, -E and you write it in Hebrew, and you add up the numerical value, what do you get? No, you get 666. You get the number of the Antichrist which shows that, that the Messiah of the Buddhists is not like the Christian or the Jewish Messiah or the Muslim Messiah, but he is in fact the Antichrist. <laughs> um, now, I found this on the internet. <laughs> um, I checked it out. I you know, wrote it in Hebrew characters and did the addition, and, and he's right. 
It's 666. Um, uh, but by and large, this sort of divination by numbers has faded away and is basically uh, uh, fairly silly. But other sorts of divination, um, I've already mentioned the uh, divination by the livers of, of sheep, but other sorts of divination are worth talking about more because they have to do with uh, what is it that, that causes things to happen in the world of human life, in the sublunar sphere that we inhabit? Uh, and can you predict it? Uh, or if something happens, can you contextualize it according to a broader construct that you can detect through divination. So I will pick up on uh, Thursday and talk some more about divination. I might be a few minutes late on Thursday because I have a panel I'm supposed to be on over on the east side, and I'm not sure I'll be back in time. <laughs>